Japanese participation in World War I was usually naval, excepting the seizure of a few German territories in the Far East. Which is almost a waste, because it appears they might very well have had the best trench rifle of the war. Hi, I'm Othias, and this is the Japanese Type 38, definitely sort of misnamed Arisaka rifle. Let's get a look at it in the light box. Weighing in at 9.2 pounds and an overall length of 50.2 inches, this is a fairly large rifle, and certainly a bit heavier and a bit longer than its predecessor. It still chambers the 6.5 by 50 millimeter cartridge, and it feeds five from a stripper clip into a staggered fixed magazine. Now, if you have not seen our previous episode on the Type 30 long rifle, then I suggest you stop now and go back and take a look because we are going to build on that. Recapping slightly, despite being radically better than the prior Murata, even before the Russo-Japanese War, the Imperial Japanese Navy wasn't happy with the Type 30. They cited frequent jamming, dirt, water, and mud entering the action, weak extraction and breakages, and the complicated bolt disassembly. I should clarify one thing right here at the beginning. The only rifle developed by Nariyakira Arisaka was the Type 30. And this gun is popularly known in the West as an Arisaka, as are almost all Japanese rifles. But, uh... Honestly, if we had to give it a name, a name that really uh, went with its designer, it would have to be Nanbu. Kijiro Nanbu was born in 1869, a son of a samurai retainer in the Nabeshima clan. Due to financial troubles, he was raised by a merchant, however. Taking full advantage of the new Japanese meritocracy, he enrolled in the Imperial Japanese Army Academy, eventually being placed at Tokyo Artillery Arsenal in 1897, under the rank of lieutenant. There, Nanbu would work under Arisaka for a few short years. He would even design the muzzle cover for the Type 30 rifle. Uh, quickly after though, as we said in our previous episode, uh, Nariya Kira Arisaka goes off to bigger and better things. But the Imperial Japanese Navy was not happy with the Type 30 and wanted a few adjustments made. And so Nambu was put in charge of that process. And so he would come up with what we know as the Type 35. He would create an enlarged cocking knob to act as a gas shield. He would enlarge the bolt handle, flatten the safety hook into a paddle shape, improve the bolt head and that feeding angle of the ammo, Importantly, he reduced and simplified the number of parts in the bolt. Oddly, he would fit a Dutch-style rear sight. And most noticeably, he fitted a sliding dust cover. The Type 35 would be adopted in 1902, but very, very quickly displaced by the Type 38 that we're discussing today. Uh, that means that roughly 38,000 were ever made and used by the Imperial Japanese Navy, so they are rare. We do not have one with us today, but luckily that's not what we're talking about. Uh, now, there's two big takeaways from this gun when you're thinking in terms of understanding Nanbu. One, he was absolutely obsessed with reducing and simplifying the rifle. And two, he wanted to seal the gun. He wanted to keep out all of the bad elements that were really wreaking havoc on this design, especially when you're an island-hopping, jungle-fighting nation. Uh, while I don't, like I said, have a Type 35, I do want to talk about its dust cover, and luckily, there is another rifle that used a near-identical dust cover, also made around 1902, also made in Japan, and that is the Thai Type 46 Mauser. This guy right here. We're not going to talk about him in detail today, but I do want to use him to show you what was really irritating Nanbu about this particular dust cover. So let's take a closer look. Again, ignore all the Mauser features. Ignore everything about this gun that isn't this dust cover. Oh, excuse me. This dust cover. All right. Uh, instead, let's just talk about how it works. Because, as you can see, we're all nice and sealed up. It's nice and tight. You can't see down in the action. Pretending that this is an Arisaka, uh, or 
well, yeah, type 30. Uh, we will lift our bolt, pull back. We cannot load. And if we had a spent casing, we cannot eject. So what we must do is be cognizant of that fact. And we must, before using the gun, pull a little on this tab right here, just give it a tug and push forward. And there we've exposed the action. We can use the gun like normal. And then when we are done fighting and whatever, if we're gonna lock open, well, we know to put our bolt away and we can pull back our dust cover. Now that seems fairly simple to you and I, but it drove Nanbu crazy. He felt that this was a wasted motion because now we have to huck and pull. So if we got into any sort of combat in a hurry, if, if we're marching through the jungle and somebody sets upon us, well, yeah, we can fire one shot, but then before we cycle it for the second one, we gotta go through this other action. And if we goof up, and we forget and bang and panic and work this bolt. Now we've got a spent casing jam down in there. We're causing all sorts of problems. It's a nightmare. Nanbu would prove to be possibly the perfect man for the job of updating the Type 30 rifle into the new era because he was a perfect modernist. I mean, he wanted absolute simplicity, absolute uh, function, he actually would sit down and come up with a complete list. I mean, he never forgot about the Type 35. It, it bored at him, and even after he was done adapting that Type 30, he kept thinking about it. And he would come up with a list of five points that he felt would be absolutely essential to the next Japanese service rifle. One, it must be simple. Minimally trained, potentially illiterate troops should have no problem using or servicing the rifle. It should offer no unnecessary confusion to the uninitiated. Number two, it must use a minimal number of parts, especially in the bolt. Simplicity means great savings in manufacture and prevents wasted effort and unnecessary breakage. Three, it must be rugged. The rifle will be taken to war, not on a Sunday stroll. It needs to be nigh unbreakable. Four, it must be absolutely reliable. No misfires, no misfeeds, no failures of any sort. It must work always, repeatably. Five, it must be handsome. A dignified appearance to Nanbu would inspire troops' confidence and encourage them to take pride and therefore good care of their rifle. Thankfully for the Imperial Japanese Army and Navy, Nambu was given an appropriate rank to see his ideas taken out, because he would rise to that of Major and Chief of Rifle Manufacture in 1904. Now, the Russo-Japanese War wrapped up and everybody could see what Nambu had already seen, which was all the problems with the Type 30, uh, and they were ready to adopt a new rifle, one that he had worked out dang near this in 1905. Now, that year, 1905, corresponded to the Meiji Imperial year of 38. This is not yet adoption, it's just when his plans are ready. So the gun is named for when it was finalized. Adoption would follow, however, in May of 1906. Along with the rifle came an improved version of the Type 30 cartridge. Still 6.5 by 50 millimeter, this had a lighter Spitzer bullet and a little more powder that would push that muzzle velocity up to 2,500 feet per second. Generally, this is an improved cartridge. So Japan has a new rifle and a new cartridge. Uh, the question is, does it meet up to the expectations set by Nambu, those five points? Well, uh, let's take a quick glance from far away and see that we still have the Type 30 styling, which was inherited over from the Mauser 93, so there's not all that different. Uh, if we were to look closely, you'll see that it's still a two-piece butt. Um, sling swivels are the same. I mean, a lot of this is the same setup, guys. Um, mag release, that sort of thing. I'm not going to go into the things that are the same as the Type 30. We have a video for that. But if we take a closer look at the action, we're going to see a radically improved design. One that is so alien from the previous one that it really doesn't deserve to still be called an Arisaka. First and foremost, uh, I probably need to talk about this dust cover because it's right in the way. A lot of people talk about these being rattly and horrible, and this one, unfortunately, is not original to this gun, so it has a little bit of slop in it. But realistically, if you ever find serial match ones, they're tight, they don't make any noise until the action's open, and by the time you're doing that, 
the action itself is quite loud. So the cover's not adding anything on top of that realistically. There's also a lot of rumors about these being tossed aside by soldiers. They definitely were not. The Japanese took very good care of their weapons and appreciated them in complete condition. And believe me, they would be punished severely if they did not keep their gun in pristine working order with all of its original parts. Uh, let me go ahead though and remove this dust cover because it's gonna hide a lot of the action. But as I do, I wanna explain, look, look at how superior this design is to the previous one because it's all one motion. We work the bolt as naturally as we would any other rifle and the cover stays with us the whole way. Whenever we're done with the gun, the gun is sealed. When we need the gun, the gun is available. It's beautiful in its simplicity. I know it's not the most attractive thing in the world, but honestly, it's very, very intelligent. And you'll even see some Austrian designs experimenting with this at the end of World War I, and you'll see it appear in China on that Leo Type 13 rifle. We'll get there in a moment. All right, so let me go ahead and pop this guy out. It's a Mauser style release now, 98 style release. And then slip this cover off and we can set this aside. We really don't need it because uh, we want to see what's going on. All right, so looking at the gun, we have what looks like a Mauser action with a cock on close bolt. So I have to push in and turn. Uh, I want to grab my patented plastic poking hand and point one thing out. We had a similar third lug set up on the Type 30. Nanbu's improved this. He's got a nice gradual sweep. So that means it's gonna be hard to see with my big hand, but as I push, I can sort of turn into that guy to get a little extra leverage. And what it's doing is it's camming me forward against that last bit of spring pressure. It's really locking that bolt down into place. It's helping me get that last bit of oomph without extra work. And it's gonna be absent in the later 99, and you'll notice that the 99s are a little stiffer because of it. Uh, so the other thing is it has a leading edge that will also help sort of cam back as we pull back. Helps with extraction just a bit. It's more than just a safety lug. It's also doing some work for us. Uh, again, you can see clearly even from the outside, we have the full length Mauser extractor now. This is the best way to resolve the problems with the Type 30 with the breaking of extractors. Uh, we have our two gas ports like we're on the Type 30. These are excellent safety features, but Nambu, as we're gonna see, is gonna take this to a whole new level. All right, let's uh, see, I mean, let me cover the sights real quick. They're basically like that old Type 30, but without the top notch. These are gonna go up to 2,400 meters. And also later there's gonna be a reduced charge, so some of them might be turned down to 2,200. Uh, that's way later. All right, so uh, let me go ahead and demonstrate that safety. Oop. All right, can you see this, guys, this cap right here? Uh, I'm gonna talk more about it in just a second in terms of its other role, but as a safety, it's kind of brilliant because it uses gross motor control, not fine motor control. We don't need to use our finger to manipulate it. Instead, you press down with the whole palm of your hand and turn. Unfortunately, I can't do that and really show it for the camera, so let me just pull this to the side for a second and give her a pump and rock, and then pull her back out. Now, all I did was push in and turn with the palm of my hand. It's just hard to show on camera. I'll undo it with my fingertips so you can see it, but there's no need to use your fingertips. Also, uh, depending on the era, you're gonna see some slight differences in the size and shape of this. And as a matter of fact, later on, they're gonna be notched. But early on, you had this little extra dimple to sort of stick up into your sight picture a bit so that you would see that your safety is on. Uh, consequently, this also turns a lug into the left side of the action so that you can now no longer open up the bolt. It's all locked down. All right, so uh, like I promised, I'll just push that in, turn it back and release it. There she goes. We're now ready to fire. Again, gross motor control. You could have frostbitten fingers and still manage to do this, although the trigger would be a little tricky. All right, so once again, we'll get that bolt out. Once again, just like a Mauser, I'll get her back and then pull this lever. She's free. The rest of this gun, uh, just to cover something real quick before I get into the bolt, uh, a lot of people wonder about this notch here. That is actually a drain hole of sorts. Uh, the whole stock set up to push sort of loose sand and water up to this point. It's also a low point in the stock so that as you're using it in harsh wet weather conditions, it can actually drain off so you don't get moisture built up between the metal and the wood rotting away the interior of the stock. This is an island and mud and wet conditions rifle. All right, let's get this guy to the side. Looking at the bolt, we're again going to see what is obviously Mauser derived, but uh, it's got some improvements. Number one, in the lugs themselves, right here, these locking lugs up here, guys, they are 
wider and shallower, which means that they have the same surface area as a 98 style Mauser essentially, but uh, they don't stick out as much. They get it from going around wide. Uh, that reduces the potential for shearing, but gives the same amount of locking strength in terms of surface area. So that makes this stronger than a Mauser 98 style lock because of wide and shallow. Uh, we also have, a lot of people get confused about this. This lug here uh, is often referred to as a safety lug or things like that. Not so much the safety lug as the bolt handle root itself. Uh, this lug turns into the up position when we're locked, and you can see it at the top of the rifle. It's not doing anything much at that point. What it's really doing is, as we withdraw this from the action, and it hits the bolt stop, it keeps us from deforming the front lug with the bolt stop. Uh, somebody should have told the Canadians about this little feature. Uh, the other added benefit of this is that the front lug is not as long as the thumb gap. Whoop in the receiver for loading. So when I want to load and I've got a little room for my thumb right here, this little cut, uh, as the first lug would pass that without that second lug, you get a little rattle. And instead you have a nice clean push because the combined two lugs are enough to bridge that gap. It's just a little added extra. It's not really its primary use, but it's nice. All right, now getting into the bolt. If you have not seen the type 30 episode, Please go watch it before I do this next step. It is very important for you to understand how beautiful this is. Right, are you guys ready for disassembly? Good. I'm gonna push, I'm gonna turn, and I'm gonna release. Now I have my safety away. This is actually made of several parts that have been fitted and welded, but they are permanently attached now, so it's one final unit. And then inside, we have a striker slash firing pin and a spring set down inside. This is a little unnecessarily complicated in the terms that it's shrouded like that. I've looked for a reason why he preferred this, and the only thing I can come up with is it really helped him handle the gas mitigation. Remember, everything about this is built for gas. So if we look at our bolt body, uh, we've got these, we've got a gas hole up here. Uh, we've got a firing pin hole that we can take gas in through if it starts to leak from the chamber. It gets redirected through these guys. These guys all redirect everything back in the raceways. The raceways always redirect it back to away from the gun or away from the shooter. The whole gun's built to redirect everything back forward away from the shooter, and the final say in all that is actually this guy, the safety brilliantly is cupped so that it acts as a gas shield that reflects gas. It doesn't just dissipate it away from the eye, it reflects it back forward into the areas where we want to blow gas well away from the shooter. And uh, unfortunately, we didn't get it on film, we did have a couple failed casings because of some hand loading issues. They all blew gas out the gas ports at the front of the gun. None of them got anywhere near any shooter's eyes, unlike some of the other designs that we've seen uh, over the filming of this show. So it's a beautiful, beautiful gas mitigation system. It is absolutely safe for the shooter. It's all made of superior, superior steel with wonderfully locking lugs, extra locking lugs, extra stability, extra gas mitigation, supreme gas reflection. Everything about this is basically adding up to be one of the strongest actions we've ever seen. Whew. Okay, with all of that praise, and I'm sorry guys, it deserves it, uh, let's get this over to an animation so that you can see a bit of its Mauser heritage, which is much easier to see from the side. Oh yeah, that looks like a Mauser. But that gas shield should still stand out, drastically reducing the number of parts in the gun. Way lower than even the Mauser 98, we have six total bolt parts, and that includes the ring for attaching the extractor. The safety again is push and turn, locking the striker from being able to go forward into the sear. Otherwise, this is a pretty straightforward rifle with no surprises. All right, let's turn this over to May. All right, we're going to load off the strip clip. Behave you. Bolt forward. Aim. 
and Okay, our safety is just an easy push and a twist. And no bango. Oh yeah, and don't forget, the follower locks the action. Now, slow-mo. So how to do? A little high, but tight grouping. Take it away, Othias. I have to admit, we shot all of the Arisakas on the same day. That was a good day. All right, uh, getting into some more detail, I should say that all of the rifles that would have been in World War I, which is our primary concern for the series right now, would be made out of that same arsenal as the Type 30. But plenty more would come online after the war and before World War II, so I would feel bad leaving you guys out and restricting down to just that because there's not a lot I'm going to be able to say after this episode on the Type 38 to build up another episode. So let's just go ahead, get through all of these potential arsenal markings, and so that you guys can be a little more informed about whatever you've managed to find today. The Tokyo Artillery Arsenal, as we said, handled all production up through World War I and until 1923. A reorganization project was begun just before one of the biggest natural disasters in history, the Great Kanto Earthquake. This incredible event leveled much of Tokyo and put a firm pin in the need for Japanese military industry to decentralize. So planning was begun, but lots of industries were affected, and it took time to implement. Rifle production during this period would be scant. Overall total production of the Type 38 rifles from the Tokyo Artillery Arsenal would reach roughly 2,100,000 before it finally stopped operation. Now, I could do all the arsenals in chronological order, but I kind of like the idea of following one particular assembly line, because that basic machinery, assembly line, equipment, all that stuff out of the Tokyo Artillery Arsenal, it's going to go straight over to Kokura. Now, this uh, arsenal was founded in what is now Kita Kyushu in 1916, but it was rather small. After the Kanto quake, it would be expanded radically and begin official rifle production, in 1933. Inheriting Tokyo's responsibility for rifle production entirely, meaning that Tokyo's done, it also took on the same stacked cannibal marking because, frankly, it took the same dies. Kokoro would wrap up the Type 38 production sometime in 1941 in favor of the later Type 99, having produced some 500,000-ish Type 38 rifles. Interesting tidbit, Kokoro was supposed to be the site of the second atomic bomb, but weather sort of knocked that out the day of, and the rest is history. Alright, so the assembly line at Kokoro, by the way, once it was retired, as we said in 1941, would be moved again. Uh, this time over to Korea, which Japan had annexed in 1910, but there wasn't a lot of infrastructure in place, so an arsenal system was sort of not really available. But, uh, with the invasion of Manchuria, it became more important to have some mainline support. I mean, we're starting to move into China. So, uh, the Korean city of Incheon would actually be renamed by the Japanese to Jinsen, and an arsenal would be established there. It would take a few years for Jinsen to be ready for rifle manufacture, but in August of 1942, it would begin rolling out Type 38s, again, using that assembly line from Kokura, which had been previously taken from Tokyo, although this time they changed that stamp. Uh, the production would only last until May of 1943, just a few short months, when it was switched over to the Type 99. Uh, that means with a rough, rough estimate of 13,000 rifles, Type 38 rifles, Korean Type 38s are the rarest. Turning back to 1923, the Nagoya Arsenal was started up to help spread production around. Although smaller at first, it would be expanded in 1933 with German equipment. 
It would produce the Type 38 until 1942. Roughly 327,000 Type 38 rifles were built out of Nagoya. 1923 must have been a busy year because over in the three eastern provinces, also known as Manchuria, warlord Chong Solin had started up an arsenal at Shanyang, using assembly lines purchased from Steyr in Austria. This would lead to the production of the Type 13 Mauser, a design that was actually meant to be the next Austrian rifle of World War I, although with a Monlicker magazine. But it was abandoned. With the aforementioned invasion of Manchuria, Manchukuo was formed. Shanyang became Ho Ten, and the arsenal was seized. Around 1936, it would begin production of Type 38s, and that would last until 1944. These were primarily issued to Manchukuo troops. Roughly 148,000 rifles would be produced by Ho Ten. Okay, that was a lot. Uh, I could get into some more details about markings, especially as pertains to serial numbers, but I need to kind of balance some episodes. There will be a part two to this that deals with the carbines. I'm going to fit it in there a little awkwardly. It balances out the load. Uh, with that, I think it's time to leave behind Japanese use of the Type 38 because realistically, in terms of World War I, there's not a lot to say. I mean, we have the siege of Tsingtao and a few other minor scuttles, but that's about it. These are not huge commitments of troops. This, the gun worked well, obviously. The Japanese succeeded. Uh, there were no complaints, and it, nothing was changed about it after those. But that's really it. There's, there's not a lot of mass use on that front. I will say, however, though, since this is sort of an overall episode, we're going to see a lot of use out of this gun in World War II. Um, the Japanese expansion throughout the Far East would continue right up until the U.S. involvement in the war. Um, the thing is, when you come up against the U.S., a lot of the guns used against the U.S. will be the later 7.7mm 7 99s. These guys stayed mostly on mainland China. Not to say that they didn't get pointed at the U.S. Plenty were brought home by U.S. servicemen, so we know they were. But uh, these were generally seen on the continent, and 6.5 was generally used on the continent. And so uh, this gun has a lot, a lot of service history throughout China and Japanese expansion. But we're still sort of World War I focused right now. And what am I really going to tell you guys? I mean, it shot well. It, it did great. Uh, it had a little bit of trouble with foliage. But we'll get to that in the wrap up. All right. So another user of this gun in World War I would actually surprisingly be Britain. You see, they were desperate to free Lee Enfields for the front line. And so they would have purchased some 150,000 Japanese rifles, the overwhelming majority of them being Type 38s. Acquired through the Japanese Pacific Union Company, these uh, Type 30 and Type 38s, mostly 38s, uh, would be registered under the name of Rifle Magazine .256 inch Pattern 1900 for the Type 30 and 1907 for the Type 38. They were named after the perceived British uh, issuance of them in Japan, not their actual adoption dates. It appears that every British contract rifle has the same stacked cannonball discharge marking. Although that does not mean that every gun so marked went to Britain. Also, if you're confused about these cancellation marks, again, check out that Type 30 episode. These would be issued to the Navy, uh, guards, rear echelon troops, irregulars, and a lot of them would be soaked up in training. Uh, they were obviously welcomed. They have been found with British unit marks. Honestly, it's kind of nice. Always, always check your tang, guys. You never know what's going to be on there. Um, mostly back at the rear of the rifle and the buttstock. All right, so uh, while they were a happy find, they were not standard caliber rifles. So by 1916, they were done with them. Uh, the P-14 was rolling out. We have more short magazine Lee Enfield production. Um, they're starting to become redundant and the British don't want to keep them around unnecessarily. So the majority of them would be discharged straight back to, you guessed it, Russia. And that is where another big chunk of Type 38s, in addition to the earlier Type 30s, show up. Again, see our previous episode. But not all of them apparently went to Russia because we have a note from the T.E. Lawrence of Arabia. Later, some Japanese rifles, most of them broken, were received. Such barrels as were still whole were so foul that the two eager Arabs burst them on the first trial. 
You know, I think Larry was subject to some hyperbole because I would be amazed if you could burst a Japanese rifle by shoving a steel rod down the barrel. Uh, these things are beautifully strong. And I should probably, on that note, turn uh, everybody's attention to the fact that I am now smitten. Uh, May has chosen previously that the 1917 was her favorite rifle so far in the series. Well, I'm declaring this one my favorite so far, and for good reason. The gun is rugged and dependable. It's accurate out to 500, 600, 700 meters. It does not reach its full range nearly as well as some of the other heavier hitting cartridges, but why do I need the full range? As a matter of fact, 6.5 by 50, some argue, is the first real view of an intermediate cartridge. Uh, we're going to see with the Fedorov rifle, something we'll talk about later if we can. That gun, people argue, the 6.5 in it is basically intermediate. Well, intermediate is advanced. Intermediate is what we know a battlefield to actually be from learned lessons. And 500 yards is perfectly acceptable in most of the theaters of World War I. Uh, and by the way, if you're in a trench and mud packed on top of you, if you've got rot in every direction, this is your gun. It has a sealed action. It has the means to help. If it has some sort of problem with extra mud stacked up somewhere in it, it can blow it off. It sheds mud every time you close the action. It keeps water out of its stock. Uh, the whole thing is perfect for the trenches. And yet, other than the handful that went to Russia that managed to get to X, Y, or Z, it really probably didn't make it into trench lines, which is kind of odd. Um, I'm sure, I'm sure you guys could bait Ian in doing a mud test on one of these guys. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Uh, but, anyway, this is my pick for World War I. And it's sad that it really, well, I mean, not that I want Japan to have gone to the trenches, but it's, it's sad that you didn't get to see it tested that heavily because I bet it would have done a good job. And I'm stuck with a what if, and I hate what ifs. But it doesn't matter, I like this rifle. All right, uh, on all of that praise, let's go ahead and turn it over to May and see how she feels about it. Maybe it's time to get rid of that 1917. Once more, same as before, we have May, we have Gun. Uh, let's see what happens when we put them together. Hold on, let's just... Okay. Combine to form May Gun. So anyway, talking about ergonomics, um, for any of you that haven't gone back and watched the Type 30 episode, Go do that now because a lot of the ergonomics for that one are going to be similar to this one except for the uh, four stock up here it's a little bit thicker and well in general it's a little bit thicker overall however they were very nice and they kept that thin wrist down here which i appreciate thank you mr japanese man um the action i thought was not quite as smooth as the type 30 but I do appreciate this extractor. It actually extracts and extracts well. Hooray, no problems with that. Um, I will say though that as far as cock and closes go, this one was actually, I felt a little bit stiffer than what I was expecting. I've done cock and closes before and I understand more pressure push forward with it. But this one, it just felt like it almost like doubled in the amount of force on that last little half inch that it had to push down and for and down to the right. So eh, it just wasn't my favorite. Um, but yeah, that's, that's pretty much it for ergonomics. It I actually did like this over the Type 30. I do believe you cheated us on one thing right there, though. You didn't describe the safety. Dang. Yeah, okay. Sorry, my bad, guys. So as far as the safety goes... I technically, I do prefer the hook one, but this one's actually pretty simple. You just push in with your palm, rotate to the right. It's actually, it's simpler. I understand it. It's just, I don't know. I've got fingers. I like using them. So I, I just like the hook safety. It's just a preference thing. But this one, I will say it is technically easier to use and it's easier to push out with your body than it is to pull in. So eh, it's just a preference thing. Yeah. As we said, that guy you don't need fingers to operate. Although I don't know what you're doing with a gun without a trigger finger at least. All right, so uh, we've got through our ergonomics. I guess we gotta go in our usual order here and talk about actually shooting this rifle. Um, I'm going to assume that there's gonna be some similarities to the Type 30. We are pushing a similar cartridge. I mean, it's the same dimensional cartridge, slightly more oomph on the powder uh, and a pointed bullet, but uh, same rough weight of the gun, maybe a little bit heavier. Hopefully you're not gonna see a lot of difference. Do you wanna really describe how that went for you? As far as shooting goes, this is similar to the Type 30. Still has shallow sights, uh, two-stage trigger, Mauser trigger, so not real difference there. Still smooth. 
Um, the recoil I thought was very similar to the Type 30. It was incredibly manageable, still like shooting an SKS. Um, the only difference we really get to is when it comes to the action. I felt that action, like I said, with the bolt-on close, it was a little more difficult. It did actually have a lot more pressure required for it. It was still, the action itself was smooth, but I did actually try shooting from the shoulder a few times off camera just to kind of test it out. And I felt like I was pulling a little bit to the left when trying to push it on home, bolt it forward. It, it just wasn't my favorite. But overall, this was not a bad shooter. This was great. Well, considering how much you cared about that Type 30, uh, if we've solved the extraction problem, which you mentioned a bit earlier, but mm -hmm. okay, we've got extractor. Uh, we have a stronger action that is now obviously free of muck and mud. It sounds like this is everything you wanted the Type 30 to be. Uh, were there any actual problems with this gun for you? It's not really, it didn't cause a problem in the function, but I'm not a fan of the dust cover. Logically, it makes sense to have it there because it keeps all the muck and mud out. It's great for that, and I appreciate it. I understand it's there from a military perspective. It's fantastic. I just didn't like it. I don't have a good reason why. It didn't get in my way. It didn't cause any issues with the function. I just don't like it. I don't know. Maybe it's an aesthetic thing. I wish I had a good answer for it. Sorry, guys. That's on me. Um, but aside from that, I want to talk about the bolt. So we had... We had let me try first a mismatched bolt of the Type 38, and it functioned okay. And at that point, we tried other, like, matching ups of the bolts and found that a mismatched bolt on this shot either okay or poorly. But then I tried a pristine one, totally matching, shot like butter. It was amazing. So what I've learned from shooting these is that you'll want, you'll prefer one to get the best, you know, shoot out of it, a matching bolt. Whereas if you get a poorly okay one, you might not be able to work the safety on it. It got that bad. It would appear that these are hand-fit rifles. And as we know, there was an American habit of seizing these things and throwing the rifles in one pile and the bolts in the other, and then picking them up on the way out and slapping whatever together because we were used to more universal parts. Uh, unfortunately, this seems to have bitten a lot of collectors in the butts because it may have set up the bad reputation for the Arisaka, in addition to a lot of those last-ditch rifles that we'll talk about when we get to the Type 99 after World War I, guys. Everything in time. All right, so uh, with all that wrapped up, I guess we have to talk to you about the final question. How comfortable would you be, as weird as it would be, since uh, other than some that went to Russia, these really weren't seeing trench duty. Uh, if you're in a trench in World War I, how happy or unhappy are you to have this rifle fall in your lap? Oh, I am very happy. This had all the improvements that the Type 30 realistically needed. It's got the dust cover. Yes, I don't personally like it, but it's super useful. Keeps all the mud and muck out. It's got the extractor that actually functions. Hooray! And I mean, it's a little bit heavier than Type 30, but meh, that's, that's not a big deal to me. This was a clean functioning gun, did not give me any problems as far as on range when shooting it. I was deadly accurate with it. The only real issue I had, like I said before, was that if you had a mismatched bolt, that caused problems. But if I've got a pristine rifle, I'm taking this to battle with me all day long. I already gave my opinion, but uh, I guess we should probably follow up a little bit more and say, has this finally replaced the 1917 for you? Ah. I would like to say it would, but the problem is the 1917, I just thought was, it hit all the right points that it needed to. This did not surpass it, but this is definitely in my top five. All right. Well, to date, this is my number one. Uh, this, I guess, would be number two for you? Mm, yeah. Okay. Number two. Okay. Uh, so we're looking at 1917, uh, Type 38. These are some of our favorites. But we've still got some more versions of this gun to go, so that's going to be part two. So tune in next episode. And uh, otherwise, thank you all for watching, and we're glad to have you. Later, everyone.
Hey everyone, hopefully you enjoyed that episode. Uh, just quick updates, Patreon is at 2348, which is hugely important because we are starting to get into the harder to find, harder to load, and we're also going to really need to push for travel for more automatics. Now we have some banked autos at the moment. Uh, those I'm pushing through now because I've managed to have a little bit of time to catch up thanks to pre-prepping these episodes. And uh, we've already gotten a lot of help thanks to the t-shirt campaign, which was a massive success with quadruple funding. So thank you all. Um, just to clarify, some people did seem to be confused. Uh, that was a bulk order. It was a month long campaign in order to gather up all the people who would want to get a t-shirt. And therefore we could order the supplies at once and reduce the cost, which is why it was 20 bucks. So uh, they are starting production now, essentially, because the campaign just ended and Indiegogo is just now paying out. So uh, I'm going to move all that cash over to our t-shirt guys and they're going to get everything rolling and we'll have a little extra to work on our vehicle so that we can start visiting more people. Uh, we're even looking about driving all the way out west. So uh, there's a lot for us to do with the series. Now, if you want to keep supporting, don't forget to head over to Patreon. And there is a behind the scenes video for all patrons, even at the $1 level, that shows uh, how we managed to do the last Othias. All right. Thanks, everybody. We appreciate the support, and we hope you're still enjoying the show.